I'm Davy Noodle, a PhD candidate in English at Penn and a lecturer in the Urban Studies program. I'm going to offer a talk today in two parts entitled, What Would a Trans-Affirming City Be Like? that responds to the text that you read. At the end of each talk, I'll provide a discussion question and some options for how to respond. Here we go. In her 1980 essay, What Would a Non-Sexist City Be Like? Speculations on Housing, Urban Design, and Human Work Feminist planning historian Dolores Hayden argues that the design of housing in the U.S. is directly related to how gendered labor is conceptualized, narrated, and compensated. In the essay, Hayden addresses the link she identifies between pervasive sexism and its bolstering by the design of houses, neighborhoods, and cities that conform to bias principles. Hayden describes how these bias principles are reproduced by implicit sexism canonical to professional training in the design professions. She argues that U.S. design culture is premised on the unstated imaginary that all women are non-working homemakers, despite statistical evidence to the contrary. This premise, she suggests, promotes the systemic devaluation of cisgender women's labor. Her essay opens, A woman's place is in the home, has been one of the most important principles of architectural design and urban planning in the United States for the last century. An implicit rather than explicit principle for the conservative and male-dominated design professions, it will not be found stated in large type in textbooks on land use. Hayden argues that the idiom, a woman's place is in the home, communicates both a problematic principle for gendered social relations in the U.S. and a restrictive principle for architecture, city planning, and land use practices. When I hear this idiom now, it feels dated to me, perhaps more relevant to the U.S. in 1980 than in 2020. There are a number of reasons for this, but one is that it assumes that the so-called single-family home is a common text, an experience all people in the U.S. share. And while that is certainly not the case, in 2020, unlike in 1980, the majority of people in the U.S. live in areas designated as suburban, and the majority of housing in those suburban areas is composed of freestanding individual houses, what might be referred to as single-family homes, regardless of how many families they contain or whether or not their occupants would find the term family relevant at all. These freestanding houses each have a kitchen. Most have a washer and dryer. Many of them are enormous. Many of them are located on privatized land with a lawn or grounds that must be maintained. Hayden's argument is that in the context of design norms that anticipate the privatization of domestic labor, it is impossible to change the expectation that cisgender women do that labor without transforming the labor assumed as necessary to facilitate daily life by changing the design of the single family home. I find Hayden's essay useful, both because it's provocative and because it's problematic. In the first weeks of this course, you read Crenshaw's intersectional critique of the US legal system's failure to account for the position and experience of black women. You've read Stryker's provocation that trans studies offers the tools to interrogate, quote, the cultural mechanisms that work to sustain or thwart specific configurations of gendered personhood. You've listened to Kim Tallbear discuss decolonizing sex and refusing the settler colonist kinship and sexual norms of the white cis and heteropatriarchal family. Applying these critiques to Hayden focalizes the limitations of her argument. Hayden describes a housing type that is disproportionately available to white middle class people, a housing type that in many cases has been designed and reinforced by racist and anti black policy foundational to US urban and regional planning. A housing type that is furthermore sprawled across the US landscape on unceded land continuing and exacerbating the settler colonist project of the forced removal of indigenous people. I'm interested in discussing Hayden's critique in order to invite us to take her premise that land use and housing are key factors in determining gender power relations and expand upon it, locating it within conversations afforded to us by the readings in this course about racial bias, cis and heteronormativity, labor, property, and legacies of settler colonialism. Hayden's counterproposal to the normalization of freestanding homes surrounded by private land is a project she calls Homes, Homemakers Organization for a More Egalitarian Society. In her counter design, Hayden proposes that labor such as childcare, laundry, cooking, and land maintenance be collectivized and fairly compensated, and that private yards be transformed into green space accessible to all members of the neighborhood. Hayden's critique and her solution rhyme with many contemporaneous and subsequent arguments in feminist theory that reconsider the distribution and compensation of feminized and caring labor. Like many arguments in feminist theory, Hayden's is both practical and theoretical about how we conduct daily life 
and how we talk about its constitutive systems and practices. Hayden focuses both on how urban space is designed and on how planners are trained to think about design. She suggests that design professionals are at once reliant upon gendered knowledge and both unequipped for and disincentivized from discussing the gendered implications of design. Hayden counters this marginalizing norm by speculating about what a non-sexist city would be like. Hayden suggests that part of the problem is that the design profession suffer from a limited conception of who engages in city making. Her objection is that in 1980, white, heterosexual, cisgender men predominantly did this work. Unchallenged in their impulses, they designed spaces for their benefit at the expense of everyone else. But as I noted before, in her sole focus on sexism, Hayden's objection to white cis-masculine design only substantively takes issue with how the design of homes fails white middle-class women. Hayden attempts to describe an experience of disenfranchisement that is common to all women in the U.S., but in focusing on gender to the exclusion of race, she instead presents an inaccurate portrait of how spatial inequality manifests. Hayden's critique does not begin to explain how the built environment of U.S. cities and regions as it was transformed in the 1950s and 1960s shapes present racialized social inequality. Physical, affective, and economic relations to the home in the U.S. are shaped by legacies of racial discrimination, both specific to and in excess of the context of design. As Kiyanga Yamada Taylor argues, the quality of life in U.S. society depends upon the personal accumulation of wealth, and homeownership is the single largest investment that most families make to accrue this wealth. But when the housing market is fully formed by racial discrimination, there is deep, abiding inequality. Hayden mentions race just once in her essay. She explains that one element of participatory housing reform would require the elimination of, quote, residential segregation by class, race, and age, end quote. She does not describe, however, the role of racism in shaping the gendered residential context that she identifies as problematic. Furthermore, in her focus on how design for, quote, homebound women constrains women who work outside the home, she does not take into account how a design model that replicates domestic labor tasks like laundry, cooking, and childcare in each home has also constrained generations of black and brown women who have disproportionately performed paid domestic labor in the U.S. inside the homes of others. Absent a substantive analysis of race, Hayden's article offers neither a complete portrait of design-based discrimination nor a comprehensive understanding of the inequalities baked into a system of individualized domestic labor that she argues is encouraged by sexist design. However, while her argument turns on an accurate social model, it does offer a very important contribution to the study of urban inequality. As I've been suggesting, Hayden's provocation to think about not only the financialization and availability of housing, but also about the design of individual homes as a site of gendered social critique offers many avenues for analysis beyond what she considers. In my second short lecture, I'll offer another take on the relationship between gender, race, and city planning that focuses on the early 1970s poems of writer and activist June Jordan. Jordan provides one alternate constellation of gender, race, and the built environment. I'd like to propose another related constellation by changing Hayden's question. Instead of asking, what would a non-sexist city be like? What becomes apparent if we ask instead, what would a trans-affirming city be like? Considering the trans-affirming city might encourage us to revisit Heath Frog Davis's assertion that both sex-segregated restrooms and sex-marked sex bus passes create scenarios whereby employees are granted the power to evaluate our sex identities. Thinking with Hayden, we could add cis-normative housing to this list of administrative contexts that seek to evaluate what, what Davis refers to as our sex identities. If we recall from Susan Stryker that transgender studies encourages us to, quote, investigate questions of embodied difference and analyze how such differences are transformed through social hierarchies, what might we learn from the design and allocation of housing about how race and gender work together through housing discrimination to produce and reinforce social hierarchies? We might think too with trans studies scholar Dean Spade's provocation to, quote, help illustrate how life chances are distributed through racialized gendered systems of meaning and control, often in the form of programs that attest to be race and gender neutral and merely administrative. We might ask how cisnormativity and expectations of whiteness inform one another and how accusations of gender nonconformity have shaped how black and brown urban residents have been denied equal access to housing through biased planning and policy. We might, in short, consider how the trans-affirming city might offer us a frame for thinking expansively about how racialized and gendered power work together to mediate and control urban spaces. I'll expand upon this idea in the second lecture. 
Before we turn to that lecture, however, I'd like to ask you to consider the following question. In response to Hayden's provocation, I propose that we ask, what would a transaffirming city be like? In your own response to Hayden, come up with a different version of Hayden's question that identifies a relationship between housing or land use and unequal relationships to racialized and gendered power. What would, for instance, a black feminist city or an anti-racist city or an accessible city or an environmental refugee city or a multilingual city be like, etc.? Then describe through speaking, writing, or drawing a design intervention that suggests one possible answer to your question. 